Welcome to MUSA's December 2023 webinar, Good Versus Bad Scraping, Protecting Critical Research Activities While Combating Unauthorized Scraping. Great again, welcome everyone to uh, the MUSA December 2023 webinar, Good Versus Bad Scraping, Protecting Critical Research Activities While Combating Unauthorized Scraping. Industry actors, policymakers, regulators, and academics alike share concerns about scraping, the large-scale collection of data available on websites and applications without the authorization of the platform or in violation of terms of service. As demand for platform data has grown, companies have taken steps to limit access to user data. In response, unauthorized scraping is on the rise. For researchers seeking to better understand platform abuses such as misinformation, disinformation, and online extremism, web scraping can be an important tool for studying threat actors' tactics and understanding patterns and trends of platform activities. The Mitigating Unauthorized Scraping Alliance, MUSA, which brings together leading companies and experts in a unified front against unauthorized data scraping, and the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, and the Banato Institute Policy Lab, Citrus Policy Lab, invite you to join this webinar to dive into good versus bad web scraping applications. We will examine safeguards necessary to prevent privacy risks, explore key definitional questions to improve shared understanding of good versus bad scraping activities, and discuss areas of collaboration for researchers industry and regulators to enable researchers to examine key questions for tech and society while ensuring websites and platforms maintain essential user protections. Today, we're with Dr. Brandy Nanecki. She's the uh, founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab headquartered at UC Berkeley. She's an associate research professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy, where she directs the Tech Policy Initiative, a collaborative between Citrus and GSPP to strengthen tech policy education, research, and impact. Brandy is also the director of Our Better Web, a program that supports empirical research, policy analysis, training, and engagement to address the sharp rise of online harms. She is a co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology at Berkeley Law, where she leads the project on artificial intelligence, platforms, and society. She also co-directs the UC Berkeley AI Policy Hub an interdisciplinary initiative training researchers to develop effective AI governance and policy frameworks. Brandy is also the host of Tech Hype, a groundbreaking video and audio series that debunks misunderstandings around emerging technologies and explores effective technical and policy strategies to harness emerging tech technologies for good. Brandy served as the Technology and Human Resor Rights Fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She also completed fellowships at the Schmitz Future International Strategy Forum, Aspen Institute Tech Policy Hub, and World Economic Forum. Her research has been published in Science, Wired, Technology, Telecommunications Policy, the Journal of Information Technology and Politics, among other outlets. Her work has been cited by the FTC, NIST, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as in the Washington Post, BBC, NPR, among other venues. Brandy was named one of the 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics 2021. Brandy, thank you for being with, here with us today. Well, wow, thank you so much for having me. And so can you help us set the stage with a shared understanding of what web scraping is? Yeah, yeah. Let's. So I'm very happy that you mentioned my show. I also apologize to everybody. I'm sick with a whopping head cold, um, so I sound a little bit off today, but... Yeah, Tech Hype is our show where we debunk misunderstandings around emerging technologies. And there's a lot of misunderstanding on what web scraping actually is and what constitutes web scraping. 
So web scraping is the use of software to extract data from a web page, um, essentially just pulling down that HTML data and then moving it into a, a structured format that can be used for maybe research purposes or to gain insights on emerging trends. So, so now just to help our users understand, is this the same way a user would go and see a web page or is, is this kind of using the same interface or the same, or is it using an API? Like how, how do scrapers actually? Uh, yeah, so I like to differentiate web scraping from API access. Now API is an application programming interface. Now, if you think about the large platforms like Twitter and Meta and TikTok, let's talk about social media platforms. They often have an open API, or at least they used to. Um, and that API allowed individuals, researchers, and others to be able to gain access and pull data from their API. Now, the company decides what data they want to make available via that API. Uh, so we could get all of the, for example, on Twitter before Elon Musk um, took the helm of now called X. We could pull some metadata for each individual, for example, when they joined, um, how, like their interaction with other accounts. So some things that you can't easily see if you're just engaging with the website. Um, but also we would be able to pull all the public data that was available. So tweets and retweet counts and things like that. So, so it seems like, um, so there is a big difference between API access and just yes. regular um, what these scrapers are using. And I guess the next question then would be, how is how is a website or, um, you know, a platform supposed to distinguish unauthorized or, you know, kind of web scraping that they, you know, they don't want versus authorized scraping? Yeah, um, that's the million dollar question, David, because the platforms, they don't want unauthor unauthorized scraping. And in the wake of several data protection laws going into effect, understandably, the platforms are becoming more restrictive and putting up some of those barriers, technical barriers. So for example, it might be a CAPTCHA that you need to do to be able to get in and interact with a web page or a login. Uh, as many of you probably know, X is now behind a login wall. You used to be able to just go on Twitter and see public tweets that were available, but now you must log in to actually see. So that's one mechanism for mitigating the ability for a third party to scrape. Now, whether or not the platforms can determine if scraping is for malicious or you know well-intended purposes, that's a lot more difficult. Written into probably all the platform's terms of service, it will say that you violate the terms of service if you are scraping. Now, once a platform realizes that a third party is scraping and they're looking at it, they might sometimes block that account or they might allow it to continue to happen. One really famous example is the NYU ad observatory where researchers were gaining access to data on political ads from willing participants. These individuals had opted in saying, yeah, sure, you can collect a uh, the information on the political ads I'm seeing, and in a very bold move, uh, Meta issued a cease and desist and blocked those researchers from being able to access the platform. So there seems to be, it seems to be difficult to distinguish authorized versus un unauthorized, at least at first blush. Um, and then just to kind of close that question, understood as scraping, um, you know, by researchers or others. Uh, what might be misunderstood as scraping? Yeah, absolutely. Accessing the API, um, I hear people talk about that. If you're if you're using the application programming interface and you have an account and you're pulling data directly from the API, that's not considered scraping. Now, scraping is the use of software where you are on your own pulling data from a web page. So I guess if, if I was an end user and I was saying, you know, say I was um, preparing a wedding list or something like that, and I was trying to get a picture of each friend that was in my friends list, and I was mm -hmm. going to each person's page and pulling that down, um, I guess that's maybe an example of someone, you know, that a platform might say, oh, you're accessing a lot of profiles at the same time. It looks like you're scraping. Um, would that be accurate or? It can. And I've actually had... Um those warnings pop up for me when I'm pulling some things down. Yeah, it can look, and, and they have triggers, right? They're gonna look for certain types of behaviors on the platform and what's happening. And then they might put up a warning and say, oh, it looks like you might be scraping. Um, we might block you from accessing this platform. And there's various types of scraping. I guess the 
the base is like you can go on and manually pull data off. Like that is incredibly inefficient. We have software that you can use to be able to pull the data off. And there are great benefits from doing that. So I hope that we talk more about some of the benefits instead of um, this, you know, fear of the harms of scraping. Oh, yeah, certainly. So we'll get to that. Um, and I guess uh, just um, what just generally, what are some factors that are giving rise to more scraping? Is it better tools? Is it um, people realizing, hey, uh, to, to your point, it, it's faster if I use a script or something to do right. this uh, in my wedding example that I just gave to pull names and pictures of my friends? Yeah, I mean, data is valuable. So while, you know, scraping or pulling down the photos and videos from your weddings that you can have that, I mean, that's pretty benign, right? But look, the new AI elephant in the room, generative AI, was built off of scraped data. And so this issue is really coming to a head right now on whether or not there are any copyright issues or data protection issues that those companies should have themselves uh, considered before they scraped data that was publicly available. Uh yeah. So, so you mentioned the NYU example and a few other yeah. ones, and I guess um, you know how are the you know certain types of scraping or maybe um, the good scraping um, or you know used for academic research or to understand trends different than say co commercial endeavors like you just mentioned um, a minute ago some some possible other co commercial endeavors like what you know what are the pluses and minuses what are the pluses first. Yeah, I think for commercial purposes, we can't think of it as being um, necessarily harmful or um, malicious in its intent. You could be pulling data to help inform market prices um, to better set the price of a product or a service, or you could be pulling data to provide a new service to individuals, perhaps um, building out a new platform that is more ADA uh, compliant, American Disability Act, so that all people can utilize and benefit from the internet and its vast amount of data. So I think we shouldn't necessarily say that commercial purposes, a third party scraping for commercial purposes is necessarily bad. It can be great. And actually that is, you know, a lot of platforms do it themselves. Like I give the example of open AI, all of these large, you know, generative AI companies, that's how they're built. Now, the other side of that for research, we also can't assume that all types of research that are using scraping mechanisms are good for society. Remember back the Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook? And that was sort of, you know, um, cloaked under this, you know, idea of it being research. And it ended up, you know, we, we saw that they were scraping data in order to manipulate public opinion around the presidential election. Now, there are so many issues about how do we come to a consensus on what types of commercial scraping can be allowed and what types of research scraping can be allowed. And I think that that's a very difficult task, very difficult for us to be on the same page. Uh, essentially, I think the platforms are going to make some decisions internally of, you know, when they see it, they know it's allowed. And when they see something that they know is not allowed, then they'll block that. In the absence of this consensus on how we define essentially fair breach of the terms of service, right? Because all platforms have these scraping clauses in their terms of service that say you violate the terms of service if you're scraping our data. Well, they do turn a blind eye to some applications. Um, and we could talk more about some of the legislative proposals uh, if, if there's still this ambiguity about whether or not scraping will be allowed. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's kind of where we're going next. Just to touch on um, the academic research aspect and some of the benefits of, um, you know, you had mentioned um, that uh, sometimes you know researchers are using scraped data to, um, you know, maybe move move the ball forward when it comes to understanding how users with disabilities may use a site, or. Um, uh, other types of academic research. And then you also mentioned API access. And my understanding is uh, for X or Twitter that they charge now for that access. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually prohibitive for a lot of researchers. And so they can't use that as a source of data for research for language or 
um, you know, what are, what are they have historically used that kind of interactive back and forth um, conversations for research. So, um, you know, just generally, I mean, I think maybe people don't appreciate, you know, what, why is academic research beneficial and, and you know, how is that um, something that's worthy of protections? Oh, man, we only have 45 minutes left. I could talk on this for hours. So why is academic research beneficial? Well, it's beneficial for society. It allows us to be able to access this really rich trove of data to be able to better understand our world and our society. The Internet does not work in a void. It's a reflection of the real world right? The offline is on the online and it allows us to be able to gain access to really rich data that can provide insight into the spread of a pandemic, right? Or public opinion on really important issues or, you know, like it's endless, the amount of things that you can glean through academic research. Now for that work, and and you mentioned the API and Twitter used to have a really robust API for researchers that was free to use. I had an account and I have published research analyzing Twitter data uh, and my work focused on how uh, Twitter bots were spreading um, narratives and tropes to really polarize voters before an election. And that is really insightful for us to know, right? Because we want to know who's behind these automated accounts that are seeking to influence public opinion and their voting behavior. And I think it's also incredibly beneficial for the platforms. You know, we we often phrase this in a way that the platforms are adversarial to researchers, but they're not. And we actually have quite a few collaborations with the platforms. And if you think about it, why wouldn't they want to partner with third party researchers who can help them better understand what's happening on their platform? help them better understand how can we build our platform that will be more useful for our users. It's completely a value added. So so now on the other side of this, and this is probably kind of dovetails with the legislative initiatives in this area, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the bad use cases? And, and I can think of, um, I think Clearview is probably the one that comes top of mind for me, but yeah. uh, what are the incentives for bad actors and um, around this, because I mean, I think you make a great case for academic um, access and academic research and, you know, uh, helping even the platforms understand their own uh, mm -hmm. trends and user base and, and how people are interacting with their services. But uh, what about on the other side, the flip side of this and wh why do why are bad actors scraping and and, uh, you know, what you know, how can we distinguish what they're doing versus what, say, an ap academic researcher might be doing? Yeah, let's let's dig into the Clearview AI case for everybody who's tuned in. Let me just give an overview of that. So the Clearview AI case, it was a company developing facial recognition software. And of course, if you're building facial recognition software, you need to pull in a, a great diversity of faces in order to train your model to be able to identify those individuals. So they went about this using data scraping. And essentially, they scraped the profile pictures from LinkedIn. Now, most of you probably on here listening, your face is probably in that data set. Now in the state of Illinois, they have a biometric protection law. So people in the state of Illinois have a right over their face, you know, all their biometrics. And so the, the state of Illinois was able to push back against Clearview AI saying that you essentially had ill-gotten data. You did not have the right to pull in the data from those individuals because they have a right over their facial image. And the Federal Trade Commission has been leading um, what does recourse look like in this space if there is ill-gotten data, if a company scrapes data that they shouldn't have and they're using it in a, in a certain way. And that is called um, algorithmic disgorgement. And so the Clearview uh, was forced to purge the data that they had collected uh, from individuals from the state of Illinois. And this matters a lot because Clearview AI and their facial recognition tool was being bought up by police departments, law enforcement, domestically and internationally. And as research has shown, a lot of these models, as they, they have gotten better over time, but historically, they have performed quite poorly on people of color and especially women of color, producing false positive and false negative identifications. So if somebody is being 
detained and there's a false positive that that is you know the the individual they want to arrest well you have now held somebody who shouldn't have been held you've detained somebody wrongfully so yeah that's a really important case um and um david did you have more questions about other commercial yeah so i guess some of the incentives for a company like that would be you know, it'd be difficult to get the data otherwise, or is, is it just yeah, like exactly? Um, and then also, or yeah, one of the difficult things too with this concept of algorithmic disgorgement, where you train your model and now you're caught with this ill gotten data and you need to purge that data. Well, essentially, the model has already learned the model weights, which is um, essentially really what makes the model work. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter for the company if they have to just like get rid of that data because they've already built their model. It can already be used. And so we're still battling this idea of how do we put in place an appropriate punishment, for lack of a better word, to disincentivize these companies from pulling in data they should not. And it's it's quite difficult because for those companies, it can be so incredibly lucrative. Look, look at OpenAI. Uh, they're pulling in, you know, it's trillions of dollars. They're a huge company now. They scrape data. They're facing several lawsuits about scraping in copyrighted works and using that data to train their model. But for them, that's the lawsuit's worth the cost, right? Because they're going to be making billions of dollars. Now, now, what about threat actors or bad actors? Are there instances out there where um, there are scrapings being done to build profiles that are used for phishing or uh, oh, of course. You know, account hacking <laughs> or that kind of thing? Of course. I mean, I would hope that for every um, bad actor scraping, there's two good actors scraping and to keep the balance. But of course, there are bad actors who are scraping to do phishing scams also scraping to sell personally identifiable information on the dark web. And and the thing I worry about is, of course, those are problems that we need to mitigate and stop. But at the same time, the benefits of an open internet where we can have researchers and commercial entities scraping data in ways that benefits society. I'm afraid that if we continued on this path of locking up websites behind these captchas and you have to go through several you know password logins that that will definitely affect our ability to understand our our world and i guess it increases user friction too so it makes yeah. it harder for people to use sites and uh, exactly. get to the data and get to what they're using that particular platform for as well yeah. um, it's a careful balance right between usability and the user interface and then protecting your assets by putting in some of these technical barriers. And, and I guess a lot of the platforms you mentioned in their terms of use or terms of service, they already have prohibitions against um, that kind of, uh, you know, unauthorized scraping. And um, is there is there any way for, you know, now that we're kind of talking about this a little more for platforms, you mentioned they're using CAPTCHAs there. I guess they could do IP address logging or um, yeah. what are some of the things you've seen that sites are doing? You mentioned Sometimes there's pop-ups with my wedding example, um, where you know if, if a site sees you downloading too much data at a particular time, they'll they'll say, "Hey, are you a real user or are you a bot?" Um, have you seen any other ways that sites are kind of um, or platforms are kind of trying to defend themselves against um, what what may be unauthorized scraping? Yes. Um, so your first example is spot on. They're going to look at an IP address and see how much traffic is happening. Are you going in and pulling lots of data? Um, at once, but another is if you have a shared account. So for example, for my show Tech Hype, we have a shared account and we can log in to our social media, our, our team. If we're logging in almost at the same time or in, in close proximity to each other, we, we all get warnings that it looks like we're scraping. So it's seeing one account logging in from various IP addresses. And we do get the warning that it looks like you could be scraping. And I, I believe we click an acknowledgement saying we're not, and, and we're not scraping. We really aren't. We're just all logging in to you know, promote the show. So I think that's another example. It's now, now for talking about, you know, scraping for research purposes, the safeguards and some of the good practices, 
based on your you know vast experience, what are some of the practices researchers need to take into consideration when using software to extract publicly available data from a platform or an individual website or um, you know something like Twitter? Yeah, yeah. So first, all of those researchers, I you know, should go through their institutional review board in their home institution to make sure that what they're doing is um, ethically sound. And once they are starting to scrape, they have an obligation to be good stewards of that data. So if they are collecting any personally identifiable information, uh, that information, I think, should either be uh, deleted or held in some password protected capacity so that another entity can't gain access to it. I also think that the data, uh, and this is a common IRB uh, institutional review board process, that after a certain period of time, you will delete the data. And then also not sharing it for other purposes that it was not originally intended. So definitely those researchers should be good stewards, making sure that they're protecting any personally identifiable information or not collecting it if they don't need it. Don't collect what you don't need. Just collect the data that you need to be able to do your research. And when you when you put forth a proposal to the IRB, how has that experience been? Are IRBs kind of knowledgeable or sensitive? Are they more looking, you know, what what exactly are they looking for in if you're a researcher and you say, what what stuff should I be including and what questions should I ask? Because I imagine not all IRB boards are the same. No, of course um, not. Levels of sophistication and stuff. So I mean, based on your experience, like what are some of the you mentioned a few of the things like data retention, how long you plan to keep the data, mm -hmm. um, what you're collecting to make sure it's for limited purposes. Is there any other things that researchers should be thinking about or trying to inform their IRB boards? Or if we have people that may be watching this that are actually on an IRB board um, and uh, to, to help them out and help them understand what they should be looking at. Yeah, I mean, institutional review boards are getting, uh, you know, savvy in the new space, right? They know that this is an issue and they have been, um, if anybody on the call has been through an IRB, you know that you have many follow-up questions that you must answer from your IRB as they review your proposal. And you have that back and forth with them and they review. And I mean, this is a big issue because researchers, we are turning to scraping more and more frequently. You mentioned X put their API behind a paywall. That paywall is so high that researchers cannot actually access the data. We don't have enough funding to be able to do it. So in the absence of API access, we're turning to scraping. And uh, like you mentioned, the IRBs, you know, fit for purpose, uh, purpose use specification for your data, that you put in place appropriate uh, data protection protocols, that you have the end date that, that you will um, actually get rid of your data, delete it. And yeah, IRBs are getting better now. Not all of them are, are the same, of course. So I think it's just important to inform your IRB about some of these issues. And, and for you as a researcher, there are researchers listening, you know, be, be responsible in the data that you're collecting and using. I guess, you know, is there, are, are people trying to get access to the same data? Are there any, um, I know when I used to be involved with medical research, that mm -hmm. um, you know, certain publications require you to upload your data sets so that you know other researchers could use your data, perhaps in different ways, you know, microarray data or something else, uh, or other forms of data. So, are there existing data sets or arrangements that might provide a better model um, for data sharing or to get over some of these um, high hurdles uh, that you're talking about, or or collectives or collaborative efforts that people could get involved with to uh, so maybe reduce the scraping, but, you know, still get value out of the data. Yeah, I would love to see actually more of that. So we've tried to do this with Twitter data by actually having us share our data together. Um, but that violates the terms of service. You could, Even when you had API access and you would pull data down, you were restricted from sharing it with others. You could only have it for the use for your research and not share it. Now, in the European Union, they have passed the Digital Services Act. The Digital Services Act is essentially trying to get, well, not trying, it's forcing platforms to make data available for independent research and oversight purposes with the idea that researchers as an independent entity uh, will be able to identify what they call systemic risks 
in the platforms through their research. Now for them, they are essentially going to like broker these uh, research collaborations, um, identifying data that an individual needs to be able to conduct that research. I and my colleagues submitted comments to the European Union on the Digital Services Act, encouraging them to instead make available a very robust, high quality API for researchers who are quote, vetted through the Digital Services Act process. That to me, would be an outstanding outcome. Look, it's going to make it more efficient for the platform because they don't have to look at all the types of data for these individual projects. Of course, there will probably be some themes of projects and the platform itself will very likely make some data sets just available because they know that researchers are going to want access to that data. But what I would like to see is that robust API that allows researchers to just be able to query and gain access to the data that they need. Now, now if, if um, these types of, you know, in, in, within regulations, if if there's not these kind of carve outs and, mm -hmm. you know, what, I guess, what's the, what's the negative impact? Because I mean, for example, I was on a plane sitting next to a professor from Carnegie Mellon and he was describing to me how difficult it is for them to train uh, large language models because they don't have the same access to data that a private company that might be able to purchase data or um, just has better funding uh, right. to gather data has. So, I mean, what's the adverse impact on the individual, um, you know, um, you know, academic researcher or independent researchers um, in if, if uh, regulations don't kind of make these kind of carve outs like you suggested in your letter to the um, uh, European Union? Yeah, exactly. And actually in the United States, we had a similar piece of legislation introduced called the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, that was reintroduced and unfortunately it died in committee. And essentially PADA, uh, as we referred to it, would have made data available to independent researchers. And you're right, researchers are falling behind, especially in the AI space because they can't gain access to the data and the compute power. Now, as many of you probably know, the White House issued its executive order on AI on October 30th. In that executive order, it called for a pilot of the National AI Research Resource. That resource, NAIR, is intended to make sure that public sector institutions can gain access to compute power data and models to be able to also glean the benefits of this transformative technology. Now, you might notice I just said pilot in that uh, not, not the full National AI Research Resource. In order to do that, they'll have to have congressional authority by passing the Equal AI Act. And we know how well uh, Congress uh, works at passing legislation. So we'll see if uh, the Equal AI Act actually passes into law, which would allow the federal government to access the billions of dollars it has estimated it will need to be able to build out this robust uh, national AI research resource. So it seems like there is, there is legislation out there that's seeking to kind of balance or level the playing field. Yeah. Well, there is, but um, I'm also working on a piece right now talking about the National AI Research Resource and whether or not it is actually a good allocation of the billions of dollars, because industry is always going to be a step ahead. By the time the federal government has approval to build out the NAIR, the field is going to be so much further ahead than where it is right now including, you know, I'm, uh, I was talking with uh, the faculty at UC Berkeley in computer science, there's a push toward more efficient models that use less data, use less compute power. So instead, because those companies hold vast amounts of data that they have scraped from the internet, they hold, you know, vast compute power. Could it be, you know, uh, uh, that they should provide access to the public sector at a fair and reasonable rate, given their market power? We'll see. And and I guess thinking about this, so, you know, either way, users, their data might be, you know, either via government or via private companies, they may be um, used again or, you know, in, in ways they didn't anticipate. So I guess what should, what should companies, researchers, um, private organizations, governments be telling end users about how their data might be used in, in you know, in public, uh, public models or, um, you know, public data sets. And, you know, how, should, how can we 
set clear expectations for users around these other potential uses of their data beyond just what the service or the platform is providing? Yeah, I mean, of course, I think in all the terms of service, there's statements in there that, you know, they've put in place protections to mitigate unauthorized scraping, but it can happen, right? And your data might be in a data set that you did not want your data to be in. This is exactly what happened in the Clearview AI case where the people had their faces in this data set. And as I mentioned, probably all of us, if you have a LinkedIn account, your face is probably in that data set. Now, did you approve for that to happen? No, you didn't. But it's just right now that is part of this externality of just being somebody who is online. Your data can be scraped and it can be used in ways that you did not originally intend. Now, in the United States, we do not have a comprehensive federal data protection law. In the state of California, we, we do. We have the California Consumer Privacy Act and the California Privacy Rights Act, which gives individuals rights over their data. It allows them to delete data, request a platform, delete data, uh, correct data, or actually you might want to give them more data so that they have more understanding and can address your needs. And this process, so while we have those rights, implementation and the execution of those rights in, in this space is actually quite difficult. There are researchers at UC Berkeley right now who are working on um, essentially a, a technical mechanism where you can query and see if the platform actually responded to your request to remove data. Um, and I'm sure you won't find it surprising that, you know, for some of their tests that they did and they asked for data to be deleted and removed, it wasn't. Um, so technically that was non-compliant with the, the CCPA. So I think, you know, we need more data protection laws that gives us a right, but also it's this balance of making sure that it can actually be implemented technically in the way that the internet is structured. So, so it seems like there's a lot of great ideas and you've just, you know, kind of mentioned a few to improve some of these arrangements or um, going forward. Um, I guess, is there are, are there any other kind of mechanisms that exist currently that, um, you know, would enable a platform to have access to uh, scrape data, but um, ensure some user safeguards? Maybe a platform says, you know what, we're in our in our TOS or in our terms of service or in our privacy policy, we're telling people um, that we don't um, allow scraping and that we ask third parties not to scrape. But is there anything like the robots.txt file or some other mechanism, or does there need to be one um, to kind of signal to bots or things, you know, these uh, programs that are scraping that a, a, a platform uh, has made representation, representations to their users that the site, you know, that they are uh, they don't allow scraping or that it's against their toss? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I think a lot of the entities that are scraping just don't pay attention and they circumvent it. So what I think would be better is if platforms, look, they can see what's being scraped. Um, and that's why essentially they made APIs, application programming interfaces, so that they could have a little bit more control, right? So instead of having people just scrape your website for whatever they wanted, you can see, oh, they like this kind of data, they want this, and, you know, and then you create an API that provides that data and it gives so much more control. What I would like to see is, platforms, and, and I'm calling out X here, to make that data available at a fair and reasonable rate. It's like tongue in cheek for Elon Musk to say that he provides data for researchers, but it's behind such a high paywall that no researcher can access it. But technically he can say, I provide data to independent researchers. So I would like to see the, the platforms do better at making data available and I think for those of us who have well intentions of when we're scraping, like researchers, if you have a really good, robust API to pull data from, that's always what we're going to do. We'll go to the API. We're not going to scrape. So, so I guess some platforms I'm, I'm thinking from what I've seen, like um, OpenAI, they do, ha they do have a researcher program. And what's your experience with some of the researcher programs or some of the freely available models, um, you know, or some of the freely available data sets? Do you see that trend increasing where, um, you know, maybe there's some outliers that, you know, have kind of shut things down, but 
Do yeah. you see um, more engagement with researchers and and uh, a better understanding of that? You know, with podcasts like yours and and programs or uh, organizations like Musa um, helping yeah. people understand the contours of this, these issues. Yeah, I mean, for those companies to engage in research collaborations, it can be quite fruitful for them. Now, let's talk a little bit though about open versus closed models. So Facebook has an open uh, AI model. So anybody can use this. Uh, now, open AI, though, even though the name is open AI, they have a closed uh, model. And this is actually coming to a head right now in the European Union. This is the main sticking point for uh, passing the European Union's AI Act. There is a concern that if you make these models open and anybody can use them, you can essentially reverse engineer them to identify those model weights, like I was mentioning before, essentially the nuts and bolts of how the model actually works. And if you know those model weights, you reverse engineer and you can actually surpass some of the technical safeguards they put it. So for example, making sure that a large language model does not produce uh, really harmful content like child sexual abuse material. Now, the closed side of this, you know, it's more proprietary. And this is why Sam Altman was pushed out of the C uh, CEO uh, about two weeks ago and then swiftly placed back in because of this tension about whether or not the model should be open or should be closed, whether or not we should invest heavily in developing the technology right now, or we need to tap the brakes a little bit to make sure that before we deploy these models and let anybody access them, researchers or other commercial entities that we put in place appropriate safeguards. So now I guess we should turn to, because this is, you mentioned a great segue to some of the legal questions. Um, and you mentioned, you know, some back for open versus closed and right. models and, and but um, getting back to more of the nuts and bolts of the scraping and just to, um, you know, like you said before, some, some, the, some of that data winds up in a model and that's why um, you know scraping is um, you know kind of a lot a lot of different issues around it right now. Um, but the one legal question I had is how do emerging regulations mandating research at researcher access to data like the Digital Services Act and you touched on this earlier, or the proposed Platform Accountability and Transparency Act consider activities we might define as scraping? Yeah, I mean. I think that obviously you can use some of the technical definitions of like, are you using a Python script to pull data off of the website at scale? Um, now is like me just manually going through and downloading a bunch of stuff onto my computer. I, I think that that would be lower that necessarily wouldn't be considered scraping in this context. And I also believe that in the DSA, that there is a provision that essentially allows researchers to scrape publicly available data off of the internet. Um, so a, a nice little protection for them there. Now, one thing I want to get at, David, though, and this is a real sticking point for me for the Digital Services Act, is how do you define who is and who is not a, quote, vetted researcher? Because only vetted researchers are able to gain access to the data. And then how are we defining research? Um, and then third, the DSA calls for research to identify, quote, systemic risks. Well, how are we, what, what is a systemic risk on a platform? What is within scope and what is out of scope? Uh, I, in my comments that I submitted to the European Union, me and other colleagues, we really called for a consortium of academics who are who have expertise in this space to vet the other researchers rather than having some EU body vet researchers. It should be from, you know, the disciplines each being able to vet and say, yes, this is legitimate research. Uh, this individual is actually a researcher at a reputable institution. So I'd like to see more of that. Uh, PADA, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think it's going to move forward which is such a disappointment um, because if we were able to gain access to more data, we would know so much more and be able to better society through the, yeah, the, the data and the knowledge that we can glean from the internet. 
Well, that's uh, yeah, that's very true. I agree with that. Um, I mean, I think uh, you know, and I think that's why forums like this are so important, so that you know more people can understand the impact of uh, passing that kind of legislation and and what it means to research community and to uh, you know humanity uh, and you know how, how the benefits and, yeah. and pluses of having access to data. Um, another another legal question I have for you is: while many data protection laws do apply to publicly available <laughs> user data. You know, scraping activity is sometimes difficult to enforce against as they're distinct from data breaches and other security violations. And I guess because they, it looks, it's it's using the same mechanism that a user uses to interface with a website. Um, it's, it's not getting into a system or doing privilege escalations or something like that or using, um, you know, credential stuffing. Uh, it's just, you know, a script that essentially looks like a user accessing a site. It's just the scale and the volume of access that sometimes trips and lets a website know that there's scraping that's happening. Mm -hmm. So how, how can some of the data protection laws kind of address that or, um, you know, make those distinctions? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> well, the data protection laws, I think are really important for giving people the right over their data. Now, whether or not, and also within that, let me just say, what, what is included? So what is personally identifiable information? What data do you have a right over? And then whether or not your data is scraped or you have a data breach, excuse me, I do need a cough. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. I mean, uh, there's a difference, right? Like a data breach is more of like a cybersecurity attack, I would consider, whereas data scraping is extracting specific information from websites. Um, so yeah, I would definitely differentiate hacking from um, a data breach or not ha like hacking as a data breach versus scraping for these other purposes. But you're right, it can look very similar when you have a script that's being used. So we have a question from the audience really fast to, if, if, you, if you're okay taking one. And, uh, the question the question asks, how can we better educate researchers about the potential risks and ethical considerations of scraping? Um, yeah. I love this question, Kate. Yes, this is such a good question. So how oh, maybe this was an anonymous question, but Kate posted it back in the thanks on our team. Um, how can we better educate researchers? Well, first, if you're a researcher at any academic institution, you're going to go through the institutional review board process. So the institutional review boards play a very critical role in training up researchers on what are the risks and ethical considerations, what are the technical mechanisms we need to implement to protect that data. So they play a, an incredibly valuable role. Now, in the absence of that, I think for the most part, definitely researchers at a reputable institution know that they, they need to be responsible in the work that they do. Now, whether or not something is cloaked under this um, framing of research, but it's really for other purposes, it's going to be a lot more difficult to mitigate that. Yeah, the harmful scraping for it, you know, under the cloak of research, but it's really used for malicious intent. I guess the purpose of the intent is always hard to discern. Always. Um, <laughs> that's the that's half of the issue. Um, another yeah. question I had from another. Um, so we have the, I'll just read this it's a little bit on the long side. Um, it says, if a site blocks future scraping, what is a company supposed to do regarding the data they've already scraped? If that's been used to train a model, it doesn't seem technically possible to stop using the data. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree with that? Or is there some nuances there? Um in that it's not technically possible to stop using the data. I would argue it is. I mean, you just take it out of the training set, um, training sets that you're using to train the model. What do you think? I mean, I think it's all around intent. And of course, in, in California, the Ninth Circuit has often fallen on the side of the scraper um, and siding with them saying that it, the big platform can't block the third party from scraping. One case is Q Labs versus LinkedIn, where they were scraping and then... Um, LinkedIn, send a cease and desist. HiQ Labs actually sued um, LinkedIn and the court sided with HiQ Labs saying that they couldn't block them because of antitrust issues in the state. So I think it's all about intent and timing. So the data that they have pulled, 
I think it's fair game to use it unless uh, some like ethical or legal barrier comes up, like the Clearview AI case where, yeah, they scraped the people of Illinois, their faces, but then that violated the law. So they had to get rid of that data. So, so the same uh, individual, maybe a different one, had another question. It says, I think this discussion of good scraping versus bad scraping is troublesome. Mm -hmm. Scraping can happen if each side has unique terms about who can use the data or not. Isn't the whole point that online terms likely aren't enforceable if the data is available via browser wrap? Yeah, exactly. So I kind of I agree with you. What is good and what is bad? We're, we're all never going to agree on what good scraping is and bad scraping. And I think, like you said also, David, it's really hard to determine intent. Did they have a malicious intent in scraping the data, right? This is why we have court cases and we have legal counsels arguing intent on both sides. Now, um, online terms likely aren't enforceable if the data is available. Yeah, and there's there's also common crawl. I mean, you can gain access to data in various ways. It's it's a whack-a-mole problem. It's going to be incredibly difficult, I think, for platforms to meaningfully block unauthorized scraping. And I think also for the platforms, first, if they are really trying to mitigate scraping to uphold data protection laws and have the best intentions at heart, or if they are um, blocking data because they don't like they're blocking scraping because they don't want independent researchers to be able to identify the spread of harmful content, let's say on Twitter or X, you know, I think we also have to think about the intent of the platforms. Are they hiding something by claiming they want to mitigate unauthorized scraping? And, and just another follow-up there. Are we putting too much um, focus or, you know, the platforms maybe, or th they're trying to do what they can, but what about the scrapers? And not the academic scrapers, but the people using it for nefarious purposes. I mean, is there more that could be done when it's discovered a clear view or, um, yeah. you know, that that uh, um, that they're, you know, going around user, um, you know, data subject rights and uh, going around platforms terms of use uh, that, you know, regulators could do in this space? Yeah, I mean, first, the platforms can see, uh, look, they'll have their common, let, let's say, cases where they see a scraper, they know, look, it's very likely that this is a malicious purpose. They're pulling this type of data at this rate from these IP addresses. They can block those individuals. Um, but for just scraping um, writ large in its intent, I think it's really hard to block scraping where you're not simultaneously blocking good, sorry, back to that question before, good versus bad scraping, any technical mechanism you implement is just going to stop. Now, recourse, what, what can we do? Well, we can have lawsuits like we did with Clearview AI. We have the Federal Trade Commission stepping in to say what is ill-gotten data in this context and what is the remedy? Well, the remedy was algorithmic disgorgement. But to be a bit of a... Um, a cynic here, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, the model essentially learns the model weights. So if they've already built their model and they've essentially squeezed out all the value out of that data, it doesn't matter to them if they get rid of that data. They've already used it to build their model. Hmm. So, yeah, that's a bit of a pessimistic view. You know, it seems like a lot of companies would be, even be dealing with this in their partnerships and how, you know, for a service provider or a um you know, controller versus processor relationship, um, how the their data is being used um, within that. But um, so, so just in our last three or four minutes here, um, you know, what are some of the unanswered questions in the space, you know, to better understand possible ways forward for privacy respecting scraping for research purposes? Yeah, that's the big question, David. It's really difficult to move forward on this because we, we understand that we want to mitigate harmful scraping. And as I've been saying again and again and again, any technical mechanism that you put in place is going to block good and bad. So what I think actually needs to happen moving forward is not necessarily to become stricter and, and disallow scraping. 
if you if you're a platform and you see some of this malicious scraping happen happening, you can either block them or you can sue them. Like you have some tools that you can use. Now for researchers, I think I just really want to get this point home that our research can greatly benefit the platforms. So please make data high value, high quality data available to us for our research. Let's have that arrangement. When I had my API access through Twitter, I signed on to an agreement saying I would not use that data. I would not sell that data for, you know, I wouldn't use the data for malicious purposes. I wouldn't sell the data, right? So let's form more of these partnerships between the platforms and researchers for us to be able to access the data and analyze it. Now, looking ahead, what are some existing partnerships or projects that we might want to follow that you're aware of? Yeah, we have an idea kind of growing. So I'm hosting a series of workshops um, virtually. If anybody's interested, go to citruspolicylab.org and check out our events. And it's C-I-T-R-I-S Policy Lab. Um, hosting a series of workshops. We held our first one last week, which was on what is fair breach of terms of service for scraping. And out of that work, we'll, we'll be developing um, a policy memo to talk about, well, how might we define this? What is fair breach? What is um, scraping? Uh, what, what can a platform do to push back? Or what can researchers do? Uh, the second workshop is going to be on data licensing and use. So if a platform has collected a vast amount of data, like OpenAI, well, how might they license out some of that data to other entities? And then the third is around compelled platform data disclosure. So this would be essentially the most adversarial relationship with a platform where they would then be required to make data available. So this is the European Union Digital Services Act model in the PADA, Platform Accountability and Transparency Act. Uh, so again, if anybody's interested in participating in those workshops, they are virtual, um, go to citruspolicylab.org. Excellent. And you mentioned you have a podcast too. What's the URL for that? And can you just talk to that a little bit? Yeah. Just... So it's actually even a, a full TV show. So it, it air, it broadcasts <clears throat> too. So it's called Tech Hype and Tech Hype is a video, uh, an audio series where I sit down with an expert and debunk misunderstandings around emerging technologies, debate the real benefits and risks, and then explore technical and policy interventions. We also produce Tech Hype TLDRs too long, didn't read, where I analyze and summarize the most important tech policies. We have an eight-part series uh, right now that's each week we release two uh, of the episodes going through the eight priority actions of the White House executive order on AI. Uh, so you don't actually have to go and pour over and read the uh, executive order on AI. We've gone ahead and done the work for you to get to the main point, what matters in this and what will the effects be? And the URL is techhype with only one H, techhype.org. Excellent, excellent. Well, I see we have more questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to answer all of them today. We're at time now. It's almost an hour in with this uh, great conversation with Brandy. Thank you so much. Well, thank and, you so much for having me. It was great to be able to talk with, uh, talk with you and the audience about good versus bad web scraping. My name is David Pataryu. Uh, look forward to uh, more content from MUSA Musa in the coming months. And uh, Brandy will certainly be following all of your great work. Thank you so much.